This is the amazing story of a royal armor workshop. The tale of how Henry VIII set great craftsmen the task of transforming him into a dazzling mythic hero, of how his daughter Elizabeth used their remarkable talents to help create a chivalric cult with herself at its head. If she'd been a man, this is what Elizabeth would have looked like. It's the story of a king, a queen, a culture, and the precise manipulation of one image. An image we all think we know very well. One of the most powerful images in history, the image of the night. Armor was protection, but it was also high fashion. It was costume, it was theater. It gave the wearer an incredibly imposing presence, making him seem invincible, superhuman. Armor has always been there. It existed in nature long before we caught up. The name Armadillo means, essentially, little armored guy. Ancient peoples understood that armor had symbolic power. From the ancient Greeks and Romans who wore beaten bronze into battle, to the Normans who conquered England in long coats of iron mail, to the knights of King Edward III who won that staggering victory against the French at Crecy in 1346, wearing plates of hardened leather, horn, and iron. Armor had always had great artistic merit, but it became a kind of wearable sculpture with the development of full plate armor. Full armor appeared in the late 14th century, when it first became possible to smelt big enough pieces of iron and steel to make backplates, breastplates, and all the other 20 or so parts that make up the complete harness, as it was called. Full plate armor was an awesome sight. It was so powerful, in fact, that it came to define an age. When we think of the medieval past, we think of armored knights. In Britain, metal armor had been worn since the Bronze Age. Records of English armor makers date back to the early Middle Ages. But it's impossible to be sure of the origin of the few rare pieces that survive, like this helmet found in a field in Warwickshire. You just look at the way the visor follows the shape of the skull. You know, the, all the curves are matched up so beautifully and all the plates fit so well together. Yeah, it, it's, it's obviously had a long and somewhat rough life, but it's a high quality piece. This could well have seen action in the Wars of the Roses. It's found in the Midlands. It dates from the second half of the 15th century. We just don't know the origin of this. So little English armor survives from before 1500. If it is English, it's evidence of very high level of skill and artistry. The plasticity of the form mm -hmm. technically is extremely hard to do. That's a shape that would be quite familiar to a modern day Olympic cyclist, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but the evidence just isn't there. We just have to say it's possibly English because of its history, but we don't know. But there is another way to know the medieval armor of the British Isles. It's found in old churches all over England, Wales, and Scotland. Here you find complete English armors, beautifully carved in alabaster. This is the effigy of Richard de Vere, 11th Earl of Oxford, a great English knight and one of the commanders at Agincourt. He carries the De Vere star on his breastplate and the collar of SS at his neck, which identifies him as a supporter of the royal house of Lancaster. The figure records perfectly what plate armor looked like. Sabatons to protect the feet, the greaves or lower leg defenses, the cuisses or upper leg defenses, the breastplate, the vambraces protecting the arms, the gauntlets, and the tall, pointed helmet. What we're presented with 
is an incredibly accurate depiction of armor dating from the early 15th century. You know, you can take one of these effigies and build a working armor using it as a reference. It, I've done it, it works. This armor would work. You look very closely and you can see how Carver has placed every rivet in exactly the right place. The rivets in, in their locations are crucial because they determine whether the piece works or not. This here, you've got the pivot point. The neck plate opens to allow the head to be inserted and then closes and locks around the neck. This is a realistic image of a real fighting knight. It's hard to avoid a sense that this is a figure that could just get right up and walk off. He could get up and attack the enemies of, of England or of Christendom. Effigies show us that very fine armor was being made in England long before the 16th century. But despite that, one man decided to make a conscious break with the English armor tradition and bring a new Renaissance style to the British Isles. That man was one of the greatest jousters, the greatest swordsmen, the greatest knights of his time, King Henry VIII. From an early age, Henry was obsessed with knighthood, but his father, the anxious King Henry VII, wouldn't let him joust or fight anyone, even just for fun. When he's a little boy of just three, he's put on his pony and he rides it without anyone leading him. Yes. Uh, he knows that he has to be, in a sense, the emblem of the virility and the continuation of his family. So his sense of his own destiny, and I imagine his sense of his own self-dramatization, must have been very intense in these years. We know he's very sporty, we know he's very strong, he's physically very robust, he's very handsome. People call him the handsomest prince in Christendom. And he really is you know, a prince in waiting, he's wanting to spread his wings. They won't let him joust, they'll only let him run at the Kintain. And that's so frustrating for a young man. All of his heroes, all of his friends, everyone at the court is jousting within an inch of their lives. And Henry is kept back by these very, very dominant guardians. Then, in 1509, Henry's father died. From the moment he came to the throne, King Henry VIII could do as he liked. And what he liked was jousting. The joust was about hitting your opponent as hard and as accurately as possible with a steel-tipped wooden lance. It's a game that demonstrates strength in body, but also in mind. I've been jousting for 20 years. Here, the armor is definitely not for show. In fact, mine has saved my life on more than one occasion. A perfect strike should shatter the lance, making the score pretty obvious to anyone. Here you see the young King Henry breaking his lance on his opponent's head in celebration of the birth of a son by his queen, Catherine of Aragon. This illustration shows us what Henry looked like in armor early in his reign. His clothing may be exceptionally rich, but actually his jousting armor is quite plain. One of the most famous rulers at that time was Maximilian, Holy Roman Emperor and Overlord of the German lands. Maximilian was a chivalric celebrity, the self-styled White King, who constantly presented himself in art as a victorious knight, clad in resplendent armor of his own design. Henry idolized him. He allied himself with Maximilian on the battlefield, studied how he had created a heroic public image, and in every way, just wanted to be like him. On armor of the Maximilian style, the surfaces are covered with dense fluting, making the steel ripple like cloth. Maximilian's armors used the very latest decorative techniques. Surfaces were often etched with acid and gilded with mercury, but frequently only in narrow bands, 
so that you never lose the brilliance of the pure, polished steel. And just three years into his reign, Henry received a spectacular gift armor from Maximilian. This strange helmet is the only piece of that gift armor known to survive. It may look bizarre, and perhaps even frivolous to modern eyes, but it's actually a mark of Maximilian's absolute respect for Henry. This really is a caricature of a portrait of Maximilian. It has exactly his hooked nose. He hasn't shaved properly. His chin's covered with stubble. And the quality of etching is absolutely fantastic. If you have a look at the little dragons that are mm -hmm. on these hinge mm -hmm. brackets, they're absolutely wonderful. Yeah, really lively. The helmet reflects the Renaissance obsession with verisimilitude, to recreate the very image of a living human being in cold, hard metal. The smoothness of the surfaces disguises the thousands of hammer blows required to form the features. Could there ever have been a clearer demonstration of an armorer's power? The power to transform a delicate human body into an invulnerable automaton of tempered steel. When this armor arrived at Henry's court in 1514, you only need to look at fragments to try and imagine how, how impressive and and moving that must have been for him. And he's got these aspirations to be a great Renaissance monarch. And then he's presented with the very best of what is going on in the continent. Mm -hmm. There must have been a little part of him somewhere that felt a bit small at that point. Well, do you think that? Or do you think, hey, I've arrived. I'm really at the top table. You know, yeah, I'm getting yeah. presents from the, the emperor. He's using his own caricature mm -hmm. as an armor for me, which you'd think was an odd joke for one king to play on another, but it's a motif that absolutely runs centrally through the iconography of the tournament. People are making themselves out to look fools and then impressing with their prowess on the tournament field. At the same time as he received his gift, Henry bought two other armors from Maximilian's court workshop. But these great works of art have been lost. Except in the Wallace collection, there are three fascinating fragments, part of a lost armor made in Maximilian's court workshop at Innsbruck at exactly the right time, in exactly the right style. You can always tell when an armor or a piece of an armor has great artistic qualities when you can feel it trying to seduce you. You know, even though we're just dealing with a pair of legs and a helmet, that's not really much of an armor. Even so, just those three pieces sitting here, they're just vibrating with, with energy and they're trying to tell you something. These perfectly articulated structures pulse with the Renaissance fascination with the mechanics of nature. But who could they have been made for? They're very big legs. They're very muscular, beautifully shaped. The calves of a skilled horseman, a great warrior, no doubt. The helmet, it's for someone with a big head. This is a big, muscular guy. You can see where we're going with this. I believe that these may be parts of one of Henry's lost armors. It's not just the shape and the size, it's also the decoration. There are pomegranates all over this armor. They're crawling on every part of the decoration. They're appearing and poking out of all of the scrolling foliage and twisting vines covered in pomegranates. And we can't avoid the fact, of course, that the pomegranate was the personal device of Catherine of Aragon, Henry's queen. It's a device that Henry made a point of wearing 
at every possible opportunity early in his reign. Maybe these are parts of one of the armors he received in 1514.